thank you to the three of you so much. It's always inspiring to hear artists talk about their work. And I know your time frame was really short, so I really appreciate um, all of your comments. And we'll go deeper into um, your work and process in this conversation and later in the gallery upstairs. So um, since this exhibition um, talks about memory and especially inherited memory, I think my first question that I wanted to start with um, was about your own first memory, or at least the first time that you became conscious or understood the history and the memory of the Holocaust. So I'm going to start with Lisa over here, please. It was in Hebrew school, which my parents sent me to, um, to learn that I was a Jew. Um, but what I took away from it mostly was that we were almost annihilated. And it was those newsreel um, films that they showed us year after year. Um, and, you know, I was like eight, nine, ten. Um, and I just, it was too much for me. I couldn't, I couldn't take it in. So that was, I think, my first memory of learning about it. Um, I, th I think uh, I have one specific memory I can go to for various reasons, but first I want to say the I grew up out of a Yiddish household, uh, my parents being immigrants, um, and the whole community we were, were all survivors. So the sense of being where, where that knowledge comes from, it's like osmosis. It was the air I breathed. Um, it, it wasn't questions, it's just who everything was, and it wasn't in terms of who's a survivor, who's not, what's the background. But to go to a specific memory and to take this further is, I do remember um, uh, in 19, uh, when I was 11 years old in 1961, and that was during the Eichmann trial. And my parents had invited their friends over to watch, um, which was in the basement in the den, and I was there as well. Um, in memory, the room is quite dark. We're watching the television. It's very, very quiet, and there are horrific images on the television. And it wasn't as if my parents said, this may be difficult. It was nothing like that. I was just part of being there. But as a strong memory, the what struck me was realizing what is on the screen is what is their lives were about. So that, to me, was a very profound moment. Otherwise, it was just um, it was our lives. Loli? Yes, well, I was raised in Israel, and where everybody who was from Europe was a child or a grandchild of Holocaust survivors. So that was the general, um, you know, we grew up on it. Uh, but the, the strongest feeling that I had and never forget is when I went to Poland uh, in 2004, I volunteered uh, uh, to work in a uh, project where we worked in the cemetery that was, um, that the Nazis used as a labor camp, Płaszów it's called, that place. And I actually worked there in that place. And during that time, in the daytime, or when the days were rainy, and we did not work outside, I mean, this in itself is, is huge in terms of the connection to that. But the thing that really hit me the most was uh, I went to the archive in my mother's hometown, and uh, I looked through the books, and I saw the list of my grandparents' family down in the book, registered Jew, you know, Jew is on the top and it's checked, and all the people from the family that were in the ghetto that were there that I never met, and, and I was just, that was what really blew me to pieces, uh, and, and that's after growing up with everything and seeing everything, going to in Israeli schools as well as American uh, Jewish schools in Buffalo where I grew up as well. So this was really so hard hit. I really realized that my grandparents didn't just die in the Holocaust, but every, they, were, they were alive, they were, had families, and they were registered, and they were gone. So I was really, I called home, and I, I was just really moved very much. That's my strongest memory. And um, while I was listening to the three of you separately, then a lot of connections went through my brain between that I you know, maybe didn't think about before putting the show together. Um, but one thing that really struck me was that um, idea of travel, 
travel in space and travel in time. And I think with the three of your work, there's really that idea of traveling somewhere, either time travel or traveling to another country, another continent, meeting people, or as Lisa, uh, going to Buchenwald, just really inform your work in a way. And I wonder if something you could talk about a little bit as well. Um, whoever wants to go first. Well, I'll go. I, um, yeah, I've done a lot of research and um, watched a lot of films and, you know, um, immersed myself in the subject once I realized that I could, you know, approach it on my own terms. And when I went to Buchenwald, I thought, okay, this will be the time that it will all come together and I will get some closure and I will finally understand. But um, <laughs> in retrospect, that was super naive of me to think that I could ever really understand it. And I would just, I spent all this time there just, you know, walking the grounds and looking at the various exhibitions. And the more I was there, the less I understood. So I, I you know, this sort of goal that I had in my head of understanding never really happened. But the process of actually being there generated all the work that I did after I got back and was super valuable. It was just a different outcome than I thought. Um, Bernice. Well, I think most of my travel has been uh, working through the, working through, working through my work. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you don't want to travel with me on an airplane anyways. I'm a really horrible traveler. Um, but, um, you know, I, one time I did go to um, the anniversary of uh, with, at the Holocaust Museum in Washington. Um, and that was, um, I, I, I met people who knew my parents. It was incredible. And it was, it was the entering of, of this family, this huge extended family. Um, and it was also in, in the way that I think, there, I mean, there were tables laid up, you know, where everyone could go. You know, it was a table from Benjing, and people who were from Benjing could be there, and children who were, you know, or, uh, young survivors. It was actually named of uh, child survivors all went to that table. But um, it was very, very moving to be meeting people that, I, that knew my parents and who had come up to me and told stories. And most of the, the best of the stories actually were from um, the, DP, the DP camps from after the war. And that's usually when there's a freedom of expression and an ease of telling a story of when life began, when um, you know a life force came alive again in them. Anyway, so that was great. Otherwise, I was thinking I so about time travel at, in, this, in that idea, but it could be a stretch, but that, mm -hmm. that's why I was thinking about that. Um, Loli? I just traveled so much. It just kind of took me, and as time went on, I went deeper and deeper into the subject. Um, visited several of the death camps, um, and then just places where people uh, lived, my family lived. I wanted, I had to go and check it really out where did my mother grow up? Where? And I had a lot of <clears throat> addresses and, and papers, and uh, I still keep a lot of it. I mean, I, I'm still researching this, but that was what was interesting for me, is to really find out the details about what was going on. And that's because I never met her. I knew that she, sur she um, uh, left, she survived as an, with Aryan papers as a Roman Catholic. Uh, and I have that original paper. My father kept it. Um, and then I, I just took all these. I made copies and I went everywhere. And then I kept going. And then I kept going a year later. Uh, but then I really wanted to hear about other people's stories. And that's why I went to Ukraine and discontinued the only focus on Poland uh, and on my own story at that time. And, uh, but, but yeah, I kept it. It was a lot of travel. And then after the travel, it was work in the dark room, developing the film, seeing what I have, um, editing it, um, putting it together, and um, you know, also you know, the books and that went through this. So yeah, this is the travel. Yeah, and this is actually leading me to the next questions I had in mind, which is about materials and mediums that the three of you use, very different mediums or different materials, but um, and it's something that you touched upon already in your presentation a little bit, but how do you see the materials that you use, the mediums that you use as, um, um, as a way to be in dialogue with 
the Holocaust, but also with um, memory, I guess, in, in more general sense. Please. Well, the, I chose gut um, for its translucent qualities. Um, I had worked with cow gut, but I didn't like it as much. And so it wasn't intentional to use something trafe. Um, although I, I like paradoxes and contradictions, and I, I don't mind that. But, um, but I chose it for its, its aesthetic qualities and not where it came from. Um, and the little objects that are in the pieces are really based on this vitrine that I saw at Buchenwald and the tiny little objects that they collected. And for me, um, that was the most powerful um, part of the exhibition. All the documentation, all the photographs, all, all the stuff that you would expect to see in a Holocaust museum, um, none of it touched me the way seeing those tiny little buttons and little scraps of fabric and crushed eyeglasses did because these are items that everybody uses and we all recognize them and it just went so deeply inside of me and that's what inspired me to make this work. Um, so each one of those little pieces is like a repository of memory um, that everybody recognizes. Please, Bernice. It's, it's kind of like a dot, dot, dot. And just, it's true for and now. Just add, no, and just adding it nicely. Even if objects are different, there's such a... Um, we're all layered one on top of each other, I think. Um, you know, as I said before, I think objects are... They're mnemonics, they're touchstones. They're, uh, they take you deeper and you uncover the layers. So specifically what I did in, in for the vitrine um, are found in handmade, handmade objects and found it's um, things that I had in my studio. Again, as a repository, I think uh, every space that you make is a repository in that way. But, um, you know, to give a few examples, I mean, there's, there's feathers, there's a pen. Uh, a pen is, you know, something I use. Uh, it, it's, 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 it's um, you know, it's an individual script. Um, the other thing that I wanted to use was the idea of shadows. So when I cut out an image um, uh, on the book, the shadow was very important because the meaning of something is not just what you see, but it's what, what is underneath as well. It's how it extends, extends itself. So I think a best example is, um, and also about the idea of ephemerality. Um, these things, they disintegrate. We have to care for them. So I did make, um, you'll see a, a cut out Aleph, the letter, um, and its shadow is very important as well. And I placed the Aleph there at one part, part of the vitrine um, because the Aleph is silent. Um, in its expression, and it's uh, an initial moment of um, reflection of uh, entering memory. And beside it are um, dried flowers, almost in the same shape. So it almost it laid out that full transition of what happens, and letter being just about books. Um, that's just a few examples. And I was thinking also in my head when I was thinking of materials about your work is also language and words. And I was wondering um, if you could talk a little bit about that as well. About language? Well, which, which could be a question for the three of you, but when I was thinking of materials in, in your work, I was thinking about language as well. Well, it's, each one is a language. Uh, I mean, like Im image and word. And it's, uh, on one hand, to use as whatever tools I can bring together to make uh, as complete a portrait as possible. So on one hand, the words are sometimes used as my response to them, where I can write to them. Or I, if it's a writer, I write their words down because that is actually what's inside of them and bringing it out. And it's, it completes the portrait, even though you're talking about a piece of paper that is flat. To me, visually, it's almost like an overview. Um, and they're layered together. It, it's using word and image um, to make it whole. And, and the same thing, I work very intuitively in that way. Um, and there's a moment of it's never complete. Uh, you know, I can't, you can't say with a portrait, okay, that's, that's done it. But there's just a point of feeling um, that it releases me. It, it's come close enough. And Lodi, if you could talk about materials. Um, yeah, that you, I'm a documentarian. I'm a documentary person, and I 
take photos better than I write, although you know, sometimes I have to write in conjunction with the photographs, but I'm just a visual person and photography is my medium. Um, and obviously this was such a multi-layered subject in Eastern Europe that I had to sort of find the language uh, that would be the most, um, that I could express myself in the best way uh, for this project. Um, and also, you know, there are other works that I did. I used uh, a camera called pinhole camera, which is very long exposures, larger, ne larger negatives, um, and that was earlier work than this, um, which I did in uh, Prague and in Terezin and at uh, the Czech Republic earlier. Um, and, and so I was really working on trying to find the, the language for this multi-layered subject. And that's what I did. Um, and then I want to go back to that first question of when you um, first were aware of that history. And I guess maybe, Mike, since the show really gathers um, both personal and more collective memories, I wonder if what what what's that idea of um, remembering a collective memory through a personal lens? Kind of um, maybe speaks to you, to your work or to your process. That maybe fine line between personal and collective experience. Yeah, maybe Lodi, you can start. Sure. Yeah. Um, well, I think that in my case, because the personal was so, it was very painful for me, um, and for me to approach my, whole, my, my very personal family experience, it's, that's a whole other project, I call it, and I, it is. Um, I think that I went to Ukraine to find the more collective memory. Um, because it's really, the people in Ukraine are, uh, it's a different culture than, in, it is Eastern Europe, and it's, uh, but I felt that Poland is really, my my home in a way this is my background this is it was much more familiar and it was much more personal and uh, it was much harder for me to continue going there and it would take me also several years and I also was very interested in finding the collective what was really what is happening to the Jewish communities and and what is beyond Poland what is beyond my personal and uh, and then I felt a responsibility um, because I had this access and people were so open and I did this extensive work in different areas, I started feeling a responsibility to continue documenting and bringing more and more information that actually the communities are, are um, doing better, they're recovering in their own way, and then all the consequence of the Holocaust and the post-Soviet rule uh, and, and, you know, all that, and because I was myself a daughter of survivors, and because myself, I had my own trauma of, lo of severe loss, um, personal loss, I, uh, they opened up to me, you know, they really felt that I was serious, and I was um, not doing it to exploit them, and I uh, gave back to them in ways of uh, exhibiting there and, and giving them, and, you know, so that's my take on the collective versus the personal. Bernice. See, um, maybe it's a, I'm trying to work my way, because it's a really interesting question. My earlier work, you know, doing the book, I Was a Child for Holocaust Survivors, you know, it's a title specifically, um, let's say, right out there. Start with an I, yeah. Um, that was the most difficult part. Um, there were many things that I wanted to deal with, um, my relationship to my parents' past and what I didn't know about it, and in the way it formed my sensibility. Um, it's sort of a dance around the Holocaust and what is a safe distance um, to it. You know, I mean, when I was younger, I would have forever be looking at uh, documentaries, seeing if I could find my parents' face. And doing the book, writing it and drawing it was a way of discovering my own conversation, my own voice with that. So as work continued, I learned about um, process of memory. That's a, on one hand, that's really what it opened up and the way my mind um, walked through that. So to walk away 
to move, I say, a little bit further away within my work, away from something that's so personal and difficult. Um, it's to use it to make something else out of it about memory. So it's, it's sort of from the harder part to find it easier. And in that way, it's into a larger collective memory. I think that's the progression that I've had. Lisa? Well, my experience is a little more removed. I, I'm not the child of survivors. Um, <laughs> but I, I think I experienced it and continue to experience um, my childhood as in a more existential kind of way where, um, you know, just contemplating what happened and what continues to happen on a smaller scale, what has happened, you know, in Cambodia and Rwanda and many other places in the world. I think that, um, I think the, the experience of growing up and seeing those films and feeling the fear, which on some level I continue to fear, feel as an adult, um, has made me, um, well, it, it made me into a political activist in my youth. It made me feel um, empathy with other people who are oppressed, which I continue to feel. Um, it made me, you know, have empathy for the underdog, which, um, which, was, which my liberal parents kind of inculcated in me and in which I continue to feel. So my experience, you know, being different, you know, being a little bit removed, um, more, more existential and more sort of universal and more um, in the context of things that continue to go on, um, not on the same scale, of course, but continue to go on in the world where people are, you know, oppressed by others in power. And maybe my last question, which I'm trying to formulate in my head because I don't know if it's a question yet, but um, while I was hearing your presentations and now hearing your new talk, there is that notion of, or that dichotomy of between intuition and preparation in your work. Your work, the three of you seem to work really intuitively, and I think that's really part of what the process of memory is also about. But at some point, there's also a certain part of research and archiving or documenting, and so I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that, these two aspects maybe in your work. And Bernice, you can start. I read, I love reading, uh, but as you read, you're, you're, it already opens a whole conversation. Um, so, but at the same time, the making of the work, um, it happens best when, when there's doubt. I mean, it's not gonna come alive if I know what I want. I mean, the whole point is, I don't have an answer to a question, um, but again, the whole thing is the process. That's why I'm saying in the end it'll, it'll release you at some point. When I did those 26 portraits, at the same time I was researching um, what they'd written uh, to find the right quotes in the book correspondences of what this long conversation would become. So uh, on one hand there's the research, but it's completely in intuitive and the beauty of the process is the private conversation you have with the work. You basically you fall in love with what you're doing. That's, that's kind of what the intuition is. And as it goes along, it's what it teaches you. As it's teaching you, your work hopefully gets better. It's a combination of the both. Loli, do you want to go next? I, <clears throat> yeah, it's constant reading and learning. I learned so much through this. I learned a lot about the world, I learned a lot about myself, um, what I'm interested in, and um, the way I look at, at life and things, and, um, and my relationship with my um, history. I'm um, a secular Jew, but I spent a lot of time, I've never spent so much time in synagogues and with rabbis and with um, people who, and, and I, I never thought I would be so interested in it, and I was so moved all the time. And so I learned a lot about uh, what, what was going on there and um, uh, by reading, by seeing, and then documenting, and then reading again and seeing and documenting, and then publishing. So I published two books from this work, uh, and that's very important, I think. Um, so the first book was self-published in 2009, and includes the work in this exhibition and color work. And then two years ago, uh, University of Texas Press 
published the book of the work. And this, is, this has more of a, of a weight in terms of the, the significance of my work as a second generation, the people who wrote about my work. I learned so much about my work through what they wrote about my work because they um, really wrote about what I, how second generation people, you know, some of our thought process experiences, although, and the person is also second generation herself, she's Polish. Um, but it was very interesting just to experience this, this um, um, you know, archive, you know, putting my photographs into a book with um, writings I wrote in the book as well as uh, them. So I think that the published publication was um, a very positive outcome uh, b because it, it lasts. And um, it's, so, yeah. And Lisa? Intuition and research, was that the mm -hmm. second? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, I have a very intuitive process. And I, uh, for the work about the Holocaust, I did a lot of reading and a lot of research. Um, but I, did, I don't make sketches. I, I have, for lack of a better word, and excuse the pun, or a visceral relationship with my materials, <laughs> so to speak. Um, so, you know, I, I just, I gravitate towards certain things and I try them. And, you know, sometimes it, it works and sometimes it's a disaster, but, um, but I have to have that kind of very loose, fluid, intuitive relationship. Um, and I think for the work that, you know, that I showed and that I'm showing upstairs, um, I did more research in terms of just background reading than I've done in any other aspect of my work because mostly I just really just work with materials and see, see what they can do. Thank you. Thank you so much to the three of you. This was such a pleasure to hear from you. And thank you for opening up to us and to tell more about your process. Thank you, everybody who came here tonight. Thank you.